see we're scrambling with technology. There's always glitches. One uh, pastor friend of mine called the computer Beelzebub. It's probably not a bad name. Uh, we're glad that you're here today. We are having our combined adult group. We're also inviting the teenagers in today because this will be a very good uh, class for them. And uh, we're also going to be having our guest speaker in the morning service at 11. And so we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes after this is over before we start the morning service. And uh, we're glad that you all are here. Uh, I do believe you'll have your donuts. Everyone have your donuts and your coffee. This is how we keep Quint Roeders happy. Just give you coffee and donuts and everyone's happy. I'm also very happy to have Spike Basaris here. Spike is a man that uh, has been used of God to uh, bring the creation message to a unique audience, people that are interested in space, stars, planets, and I've never come across a better video series than his. And so we did an In Grace, which is a television program, um, about Spike and uh, his video series, and also we interviewed a, an astronomer with Answers in Genesis, Danny Faulkner, we went to their brand new planetarium, and so all of that is on this DVD, our awesome universe, Big Bang or Big God. We just aired this on TBN uh, about a month ago to very good reviews. So I encourage you all to get this. We have it in the lobby, and uh, Spike is on two of these. And one thing that we did that you said no one else has done was captured his testimony, how he went from atheist to a believer in not the Big Bang, but our wonderful and awesome God. So I see, I see we're still having the glitch, so I think we're gonna have to go to the uh, backup plan, so are you guys all set for that? All right, Paul, you got the, the program? Okay, so um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Spike. Let's give Spike Passaris a huge welcome at Quinton Road. Thank you very much. It's my privilege to be here with you this morning and had the privilege of speaking on a subject near and dear to my heart, which is astronomy. And this topic tends to be underrepresented, I think, when people discuss creation and creation science. A lot of people seem to be leery of astronomy, and we should probably actually cover that right up front. The rumor that you have heard is not true. It is not true that excessive stargazing will cause you to lose all your hair. So, now that we have that cleared up. My topic this morning, is our created solar system. And how are we going to do this with the, the visuals? You run it from there? Okay. And I just ask for the next slide? Okay. So if we can have the first one then. <laughs> so we live on an Earth in a solar system with other planets orbiting a sun. Where did the solar system come from? If you look in science textbooks, watch science programs, go to museums, you'll be told that our solar system is the result of natural processes operating over long periods of time. That's the end of the presentation. But if you look at the solar system itself, and we can go to the next slide, please, thank you. Where did the system come from? Did it, is it the product of natural processes, just the laws of physics working themselves out over time? Or is there a better explanation? Next slide, please. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is a familiar verse to us, I hope. So the Bible confirms that indeed the Lord is responsible for the earth, the solar system, the universe. Next slide, please. But the secular model, of course, says something very different. Secular scientists reject the creation account. And they do so for a specific reason. They believe that, next slide, please, everything came from a large cloud of gas billions of years ago. This is known as the solar nebula model. Next slide, please. And the story goes like this. In the beginning, there was gas. Over time, this gas began to collapse under the force of gravity, began to swirl around. The gas condensed into particles of dust. The dust particles stuck together to become little rocks. The little rocks stuck together to become bigger rocks. Those bigger rocks then stuck together to become what are called planetesimals, which means little planets, basically asteroids. And then the asteroids stuck together to become the cores, or in some cases, the planets that we now observe today. Now, is this a good model? Next slide, please. And then one more time. 
How could we tell by looking at these objects where they came from? Well, in our time here this morning, I'm going to approach this from a few different angles. Next slide, please. Are the planets and the moons that we observe in the solar system consistent with this model? Next slide, please. Are they the product of natural random processes operating over time? Next slide. Are they billions of years old? Is there scientific evidence that we can look at that'll help to answer these questions? Next slide, please. So let's discuss each planet. We're going to go through the solar system planet by planet, spend a little bit of time on each one, and discuss how each one contradicts the secular way of looking at things in a unique, distinct way. Next slide, please. So we'll start with the terrestrial planets, the first four. This is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. They're called terrestrial because the Latin name for Terra is, uh, excuse me, the Latin name for Earth is Terra. Earth is mostly rock. The other three of these planets are also rocky, so we call them terrestrial. Next slide, please. The smallest planet is Mercury, and we're going to start close to the sun and work our way out. Mercury poses a bunch of challenges for those who wish to deny the Lord's creation. Next slide, please. For one thing, Mercury turns out to be very dense. It has apparently an iron core occupying more than half of its interior volume. In fact, it is too dense, next slide please, for the secular model to accommodate. The secular model makes certain predictions about how these planets should, uh, should be structured, and Mercury doesn't match this model. This creates a problem for the secular modelers, so they have, next slide please, what they believe is a solution for this. They believe Mercury formed with more material that is lighter, therefore the overall density would be lower, therefore it would be consistent with their model. The issue is that this, isn't, this doesn't match the planet that we see. So they believe that early in the solar system's history, an asteroid came along, hit Mercury, broke it up into pieces, the lighter stuff just went off into space somewhere, leaving behind the dense material that we see today. Now, is this really a good scientific explanation? because it's invoking things that we don't see, right? Science is supposed to be based on observations. Is it consistent with the evidence? Actually, no, it's not. Next slide, please. For, among other things, we see sulfur on the surface of mercury today. Next slide. And surf, uh, excuse me, sulfur is a very volatile element. That means it has a very low boiling point. Next slide. That means, among other things, that had such a giant impact occurred Sulfur and other volatile elements that we see there, like potassium, would have boiled away into space. They wouldn't be on Mercury's surface today. But they are on Mercury's surface today, which would indicate that this giant impact never happened. Next slide. And oh, by the way, sulfur shouldn't be on Mercury in the first place anyway, because that gas cloud model says sulfur could not have condensed out of the gas cloud in Mercury's neighborhood. So we're already seeing that on, uh, on its face, Mercury doesn't match this model, and furthermore, some of the explanations that are invoked to try to make it work don't work either. Next slide. Mercury also has a magnetic field. Next slide. And there are several different sources for planetary magnetism. Next slide, please. Uh, and go two more. There are two basic, so two basic reasons why a planet could have a magnetic field. One is called a dynamo, and without going into details, that could, in theory, last a long time, but it requires a liquid core inside of the planet. The other possible explanation is remnant magnetism, which means leftover magnetism from the planet's formation. Now, that would work and can produce a magnetic field, but it can't last a very long time. So if you want to believe in billions of years, you must believe that planetary magnetic fields come from a dynamo. Uh, next slide, please. Two more, actually. Thank you. And we'll, I'll go one more. The problem with Mercury is that it's so small is that it should have frozen solid billions of years ago. Therefore, its core should be solid, not liquid, which means that it couldn't have a dynamo in it today. Next slide. Therefore, there is no dynamo inside of Mercury, which means it shouldn't have a magnetic field. Next slide. Unless it's remnant magnetism. But as we just said, remnant magnetism can only last a short time. So I might have lost you in that chain of reasoning, so let me restate that. If Mercury were billions of years old, it shouldn't have a magnetic field anymore, but it does. That would imply, therefore, it's not actually billions of years old. Furthermore, next slide, the messenger mission found that Mercury's magnetic field is decaying. Again, this makes it look very, very young. It's unlikely that it would have lasted and be stable for billions of years and then suddenly start decaying very rapidly right before we visited. Incidentally, creationists weren't surprised by the decaying field that was discovered. Uh, 
A physicist named Dr. Russell Humphreys predicted it ahead of time based on the creation account in the Bible. The secular uh, side of planetary science, though, of course, did not anticipate this at all. Next slide. Moving outwards in the solar system, we have the planet Venus. Next slide, please which has a very thick atmosphere and creates a greenhouse effect. That has some interesting implications, but we'll skip that for now. And just focus on, next slide, the fact that Venus's surface is very young. You can't see Venus's surface from Earth because of the thick cloud cover. So before we got there, lots of scientists were predicting maybe Venus has swamps and jungles and maybe even life. It's not at all like that. Venus's surface is more like the biblical description of Hades. It's covered in lava flows. Moreover, many of those lava flows appear to be quite recent. 37 different volcanic structures have been identified that are, in some cases, apparently still cooling off. Venus is supposed to be four and a half billion years old. And by the way, it also doesn't have plate tectonics, so there's no obvious source for volcanism over billions of years. Nevertheless, it appears to still be volcanically active, perhaps today, and even if not then, quite recently. So the entire surface of this planet looks young and fresh, not billions of years old not at all what the secular side had expected. Furthermore, next slide, Venus is known as our sister planet because it's about the same size and mass as Earth. Therefore, it should be very similar to our planet, according to the secular way of thinking, because it's supposedly formed at the same time in the same place from the same materials by the same natural processes. Therefore, you would expect Venus to have a moon too, right? Just like Earth does. Next slide. But it doesn't. This creates a problem, at least an inconsistency, from the secular side of things, but they think they have, next slide, a solution for this. They believe that Venus formed with a moon, as their model would imply, and then early in solar system history, an asteroid came along, hit it, and destroyed it, and now it's gone. Where's the evidence for this happening? Well, the fact that Venus doesn't have a moon anymore. Is this good evidence? No. <laughs> Moving on. Next slide, please. We have the Earth. I'm actually going to be talking more about the Earth in the primary uh, my other talk here in the morning service, and focusing on the fact, next slide please, that Earth is uniquely designed for life. It has a lot of design features for that. For our time here in this first session, next slide please, we'll talk about Earth's magnetic field briefly. We already said that planetary magnetism can come either from a dynamo, which could last a long time in theory, or remnant magnetism. The problem with the dynamo theory, next slide please, is that when you really look at it, it doesn't actually work. Scientists have been trying to model a, a dynamo that lasts for billions of years, and they've been trying to do this for a long time, and it hasn't worked. You can start with a dynamo, but it's going to run down over time and won't last billions of years. And the Earth's uh, magnetic field actually looks like that's what's happening. Next slide, please. The Earth's magnetic field turns out to be decaying. That makes it look like it's young and remnant magnetism left over from the Earth's formation. Now, if that formation happened just thousands of years ago, as the Bible says, then the Earth's magnetic field isn't surprising. It matches that description. It doesn't match the billions of years scenario. In fact, next slide, please. When we look at the magnetic field in depth, we can model certain things. If the magnetic field is losing energy over time today, which it is doing and has been doing for as long as we've been measuring it, well, the, the magnetism is the result of electric currents in the Earth's core which are being driven by interior heat. So in other words, looking backwards in time, the Earth's magnetic field was much stronger than it was today. That also indicates that interior heat of the Earth was much higher than today. Is there a maximum amount of heat that the Earth could have ever contained? Yes, you can calculate how much heat would be necessary to melt the Earth's crust, for example. Now, apparently that didn't happen, so that's a good maximum that we can figure. And calculating backwards in time, a, ma a maximum age for the Earth would be about 20,000 years. Now, that's not to say it is 20,000 years. The Bible would imply it's 6,000. But 6,000 works within a maximum of 20,000, doesn't it? Four and a half billion, however, does not. Next slide, please. Another element of Earth that we can uh, talk about is the Earth's water. Earth, of, of course, has a lot of water here, right? 70% of our surface is covered with it. Interesting thing, though, next slide, is that the secular model says there shouldn't be any water here. That gas cloud model says the Earth should have formed without any because it was too hot in the gas cloud at our distance from the sun for water to condense out of the cloud. This, of course, creates challenges for secular modelers. Next slide, please. Because the Earth is very inconsistent with this model. For a while, they said, well, Earth formed without water, 
like the model says. And then comets came afterwards and added water to the Earth, and that's why we see water here today. Now, indeed, comets are big, dirty ice balls in space, so that seemed plausible, from their perspective at least, until we started visiting comets and figuring out what they're made of. And it turns out comets have some important chemical differences with Earth's oceans. Therefore, Earth's oceans could not have come from comets. Therefore, comets were not the source of the water that we see. This left secular modelers without a way to explain Earth's water. Well, this created a problem, of course. And when there's a problem you need, next slide, a solution. So the solution today is that asteroids bombarded Earth early in Earth's history and provided the water. How much water do asteroids contain? Not a whole lot, right? Furthermore, the, some have a little bit of water. That water turns out also to have chemical differences with Earth's oceans. And as a last item, an asteroid impact is a very violent event. Is that going to add water to the Earth? Or is it going to vaporize some of the water that was previously there before the impact happened? They need hundreds of millions of these things to account for an ocean here on Earth. So you can glean for yourselves what um, the suitability, suitability of this model is. Next slide, please. Our Earth has a moon. We tend to take this for granted, of course. We see it in the sky and don't think about it a whole lot. But it has some very interesting aspects to it. Among other things, next slide, it's the only body other than Earth that people have actually walked on. And one of the reasons that they went to walk on it, other than to beat the Russians, next slide, was to figure out what this thing is made of and where it came from. There were three competing origin theories at the time of the Apollo program. Next slide. I won't bother describing them because the astronauts brought back samples with them and ultimately disproved all three theories. For a while, this left secular modelers without a way to explain the moon's existence. So this creates a problem. Well, there's a problem you need, next slide, a solution. So if you look up in the books today, you'll be told that the Earth formed without the moon until early in its history, a very large asteroid, one the size of Mars, came in and hit the Earth, threw a bunch of material up into space, that material condensed into the moon that we see today. This is called the giant impact model. Now, you look on Wikipedia, you'll see this is the explanation there. You'll see this in science programs, textbooks, museums, all the rest of it. There's a problem, though. Next slide. Turns out that when scientists went back and re-examined the samples that the astronauts brought back, this is in the mid-2000s, turns out some of the samples contained water in them. And the samples that were being analyzed were beads of volcanic glass. Now, water from moon samples isn't necessarily surprising. Maybe it came from meteorites or something. But the fact that it was within volcanic glass, which came from inside the moon, means that there's water inside the moon. And that giant impact, if it had happened, would have vaporized any water that was present. The moon would have condensed without any water. So the presence of water in these samples discredits and disproves the giant impact hypothesis. And this, uh, this finding was published in 2008. So it's been known for, what, 14 years now that the giant impact hypothesis doesn't work. Nevertheless, it's still being taught today in schools, science programs, and the rest of it. Why is that? Because they don't have any other alternative model to offer. Is that how science education is supposed to work? Are you supposed to teach a model that you know doesn't work just because you don't have anything, any better ideas? I don't think so either. Next slide, please. Next, the moon is supposed to be 4 billion years old. Well, there's a lot of evidence against that, and still growing evidence for that matter. Next slide. For one thing, we're, we're finding that a lot of the scarps, the cliffs that we see in various places on the moon, are associated with moon quakes. These appear to be tectonic faults, which means the moon is still tectonically and geologically active. But after four billion years, it can't be. The moon is a tiny little object. Had it been formed four, over four billion years ago, it would have cooled off from its formation billions of years ago, wouldn't be geologically active anymore. But apparently it is. Next slide. Similar reasoning applies to the, the fact that we're finding wrinkle ridges. The moon appears to be still cooling off and shrinking a bit, and so these ridges are appearing on the surface. Next slide. We're also discovering fresh volcanic deposits. All of this indicates recent geological activity on the moon that can have no geological activity, however, if it were billions of years old. Next slide. There's also this experiment here, next slide please, called LLR, Lunar Laser Ranging, LLR, excuse me. Uh, these, were, these reflectors were left on the moon by several different Apollo missions, 
Next slide. Uh, Apollos 11, 14, and 15 left these reflectors behind, along with two of the Soviet Union missions. And these reflectors allow scientists on Earth to fire a laser at them. And if they hit one, can you go back one slide, please? Uh, other direction. If they hit one, which is difficult to do, as you can imagine, but they can do this, the laser bounces back to Earth, and we can measure how long it took for the laser to go from here to there and back. And that allows us to measure how far away the moon was at that moment. Now forward two slides. And this is interesting because, and I think you have to click one more time to get the animation going. Yes. So as the moon revolves around the Earth, its gravity raises tidal bulges in the Earth's oceans. It's pulling the ocean toward itself. Now, there's a significant mass of ocean water there, but it doesn't quite line up between the Earth and the moon because the Earth is rotating beneath of it and pulling that mass sideways. That means that ocean water is exerting a separate gravitational pull on the moon which then pulls the moon sideways a bit in its orbit and accelerates it. Now, if you get lost in the details, don't worry about it. The idea here is that the moon is gradually moving away from the Earth and receding. This was predicted before the Apollo program. We knew it, it would be happening. What we didn't know was how much it was happening. The LLR program has allowed us to measure this. And it turns out the moon is moving away from Earth at a few centimeters per year. It works out to about an inch, inch and a half. Now, that's not much. Over thousands of years, it wouldn't make any difference whatsoever. But the way the math works here is this recession rate would have been greater in the past, which do the math and look backwards in time. If the moon is moving away from the Earth today, that means it used to be closer to Earth. And in fact, it would have been touching the Earth only one and a half billion years ago. Now, no one believes that it was ever touching the Earth. Of course, that's impossible. The point is, next slide, please, that this moon is not billions of years old. Recent geological activity, the recession rate, and other things tell us that the moon is quite young. Next slide, please. Moving onwards in the solar system, we have the planet Mars. Next slide. Which is, of course, a desert planet, very hostile to life. Next slide. And one interesting aspect to it is a very thin atmosphere, which means it can't retain liquid water. Even though it's very cold on Mars, the boiling point of water is very low because the atmosphere is so thin. Nevertheless, next slide. Secular scientists want there to have been a global ocean on Mars. You've probably heard of this in the news if you follow these topics, right? All this supposed evidence for water that uh, keeps getting discovered. Well, you can't have an ocean on, on Mars today. I mean, if you were to pour a bottle of water out on the surface, it would evaporate away in a few minutes. How, therefore, could Mars have a global ocean? Well, this creates a problem for those who want this to be true. So they have, next slide, a solution. The solution is that Mars used to have a thicker atmosphere in the past, which would allow it to retain an ocean, but then an asteroid hit the planet, stripped away the atmosphere, which means that the ocean then boiled away into space, and it's a desert planet today. Now, this is interesting. Next slide. When you consider the Earth and Mars together, we are told that it is unscientific to think that there was a global flood on Earth. Next slide, please. Even though it's covered with water today, but there was a global flood on Mars, which cannot have liquid water on its surface today. I think there's a real inconsistency going on here. Next slide, please. So that concludes our discussion of the terrestrial planets. Moving onwards, next slide, to the gas giant planets. We have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And these are all much bigger than the Earth, as you can see. Next slide. Jupiter is the biggest of the planets. It's uh, bigger than all of the other planets combined by quite a margin. Next slide. It's famous for a giant storm system called the Great Red Spot. Next slide, please. Which is bigger than the entire Earth. Imagine how violent a hurricane would be if it were bigger than the Earth. This has been on Jupiter for as long as we've had telescopes to observe it. So as far as we can tell, um, it's been there for hundreds of years at least. Maybe even it was created with this storm. Next slide. Jupiter is actually quite beneficial. And I'm going to touch on this in the uh, morning service this morning. Uh, its presence, and it is so massive, its gravity pulls in comets and asteroids and other things that might otherwise hit the Earth. What I'm showing you here is a picture of a scar from a fragment of a comet that hit Jupiter a few years ago. So Jupiter actually protects the Earth from impacts coming in from space. It's also stunningly beautiful. Next slide, please. When you look at some of the intricate cloud patterns across the surface. From an origin perspective, next slide, it presents something called the migration problem. Next slide, please. Had Jupiter formed from a cloud of gas, it turns out that there's real problems with the physics involved here. As material was building up in this gas cloud, 
going through the gas cloud would have slowed these objects down. Sort of a headwind, if you will. Well, when you slow down an object that's orbiting something, it moves toward the object it's orbiting. Turns out that had Jupiter formed from asteroids that were building themselves up and gathering gas from the cloud, they would have moved all the way in and crashed into the sun before Jupiter had time to form. Next slide, please. As this uh, report pointed out, theories predict that the giant protoplanets, the planets that are forming from the gas cloud, will merge into the central star. That's a nice way of saying crash into the sun. Before planets have time to form. This makes it very difficult to understand how they can form at all. Understanding the formation of giant planets is currently one of the major challenges for astronomers. Jupiter will migrate into the sun before it has a chance to form, according to that model. Therefore, next slide, there's a planet there, but next slide, we actually shouldn't see it. Yet there it is nonetheless. Jupiter poses other challenges for secular modelers, uh, as do many of its moons. Next slide. I want to talk briefly just about one moon, Io. Uh, that little black dot is the shadow of Io, which hopefully you can see in front of the shadow there. Io is a tiny little moon. Next slide. But it's turned out to be quite a spectacular object. It's the most volcanically active body in the solar system. There's hundreds of volcanoes across the surface. Uh, several dozen of them appear to be active, and there's usually several going off at any time whenever we've had a spacecraft there to look at it. Next slide. The eruptions on Io can be very violent, blasting material 180 miles into space. Next slide. Actually, two more slides. Thank you. As a result, Io looks quite young. Number one. Next slide. There's no source for all the heat to power these eruptions. Io is caught in a gravitational tug-of-war between Jupiter on one side and some other moons on the other, so it's being squeezed and flexed. That accounts for some of this heat, but not all of it. Next slide. Furthermore, we've measured the material coming out of these volcanoes. There's a huge amount of it. If Io were four and a half billion years old, it would have recycled itself through its own volcanoes over 30 times. Does that sound plausible? Or does it make more sense to say this is young? Next slide, please. It actually does look quite young because, among other things, when you're cycling all this material through volcanoes, you're going to have material settle out. You're going to have high-density materials sink and low-density materials rise, right? That's how this type of thing works. If I were billions of years old, it should have formed a low-density crust by now. But it hasn't done that yet. That makes it look young, not billions of years old. Next slide, please. Moving outwards, we have the planet Saturn, famous for its beautiful rings. Next slide, or two more slides, actually. Thank you. The rings look solid, but they're not. They're actually belts of particles all orbiting Saturn together. Now, it used to be thought that these rings must have formed when Saturn did. That would make them billions of years old. But subsequent discoveries, just confirmed recently, actually. Next slide. The rings actually have to be quite young. They would get darker over time, uh, but they're still quite bright. That means they haven't been around for that long. We're also discovering that there's thousands of pounds of particles from the rings raining onto Saturn uh, every day. This is called ring rain, which again, if the rings were billions of years old, they wouldn't be there anymore, but they are there still. This creates a problem if you want to believe in the billions of years. And where there's a problem you need, next slide, please. Possibly two more slides. A solution. If you look this up now, people will talk about how Saturn formed without the rings. And subsequently, an asteroid came in and struck an existing moon, broke up the material, and that formed the rings we see today. Is this really a good model, or is this more of an, a story to try to explain something that doesn't match? Next slide, please. Saturn, of course, is beautiful as well. It's stunning in a telescope, even a small telescope. Next slide. And it also has, from an origin's perspective, the migration problem, just like Jupiter does. So indeed, with Jupiter, next slide, it, too, should not, next slide, exist. Yet it is there today. It has dozens of moons, next slide, many of which are fascinating. I'll limit myself to just one. This is Enceladus, a pretty little moon, the brightest object in the solar system, actually, because it reflects all of the sunlight that hits it back into space. And our first photographs of Enceladus were intriguing. Next slide. This is Enceladus below Saturn's rings. And hopefully you can see that little smudge, maybe not with the lights here, but there's a little smudge below Enceladus. Next slide. Close-up photographs revealed Enceladus has water geysers, fountains of water and ice shooting out of its south pole at 800 miles per hour. 
Next slide, please. Enceladus is very geologically active. The problem is it's supposed to be billions of years old, shouldn't have the energy to be doing this anymore. Some of its neighboring moons are brighter than they should be because Enceladus is spray painting them with ice and snow. Where does the energy come from to do this? If Enceladus were only thousands of years old, because it was created recently, then it could still be cooling off after its formation. That would explain what we see. It doesn't look billions of years old, though, and secular modelers have been scratching their heads over where is all this energy come from, coming from and how did it last for billions of years. There's a little bit of tidal flexing going on, squeezing from Saturn and some of the other moons. That's the explanation you will hear if you ask about this. What they don't usually mention, though, is that only accounts for a few percent of the energy required to, to explain what we see. So again, if Enceladus were only thousands of years old, this isn't a problem. If it's billions of years old, this is a problem. Next slide, please. Moving outwards in the solar system, we have the planet Uranus, which was a real surprise to secular modelers. Next slide, please. Because it turns out that the false color image you see on the right shows us where Uranus's poles are. The secular model says that all the planets should have formed in this disk and they should be spinning like tops within the disk. Most of the planets do that. Uranus doesn't. Uranus rolls along sideways like a ball as it goes through space. Secular model says it can't be doing that. It can't have formed this way. So the secular model, modeler has a problem he needs to solve here. So the solution is, next slide, that Uranus formed the right way up, and then an asteroid came in and hit it and knocked it over. Are you detecting a pattern in these explanations? Does Uranus look like something hit it? Actually, no, it doesn't. Its orbit is very circular, and furthermore, it has a system of moons that are inconsistent with a collision having occurred, yet this is the only explanation being offered because it's really the only option that they have. Speaking of its moons, next slide. This is one of my favorite objects in the solar system, Uranus's moon Miranda, tiny little moon, only about 300 miles across, but look how weird this thing is. It looks like it was a, like a patchwork quilt, like it was assembled from a bunch of different pieces. Next slide, please. How would you like to have to be the one to explain how this got here from natural processes? There's places on the surface like I'm showing you here. It looks like someone swiped a giant paintbrush across the surface. Next slide. It also has some very dramatic terrain, like the highest cliff in the solar system, over 12 miles high. Imagine standing at the top of that and looking down. Next slide. And look at how dramatically the terrain changes from one section to another. I mean, it looks like someone glued together a bunch of different pieces, doesn't it? This creates a problem for secular modelers. And there's a problem you need, a solution, exactly. So Miranda formed looking more typical, and then something came along and broke it up, and then all the pieces reassembled. Even some secular modelers are unhappy with this explanation, by the way. So some of them are invoking up to five collisions in a row. Moving onwards, next slide, please. We have the planet Neptune. Now, Neptune, with uh, being so far out from the sun, next slide, please. It's supposed to be old, cold, next slide, please. Old, cold, and dead. Billions of years old, receives not a whole lot of energy from the sun. And we expected it to, I shouldn't say we, they expected it to be a fairly boring planet. Turns out not to be the case. Next slide, please. Neptune is actually a very dynamic planet. It's constantly changing. We're seeing storms form and dissipate over time. It also has the strongest winds in the solar system, 1,300 miles per hour at the equator. It's also radiating into space more energy than it receives from the sun. Not old, cold, and dead after all. But perhaps the largest problem it has, along with Uranus, is that, next slide please, according to secular model, modelers, these planets don't actually exist. As this article in Astronomy Magazine explained, Psst, astronomers who model the formation of the solar system have kept a dirty little secret. Uranus and Neptune don't exist, or at least computer simulations have never explained how they could form. Next slide, please. It's clear that our level of sophistication of studying planet formation is relatively primitive. So far, it's been very difficult for anybody to come up with a scenario that actually produces Uranus and Neptune. I won't go into details about why this is the case, but the models say, next slide, please, that these planets, next slide, please, should not actually exist. Now, who heard about this the last time you saw a planetarium show? Or the last time you, saw, you watched a science program or whatever? Probably didn't hear about this, right? This has been known for decades, by the way, since the 70s. 
Yet you'll still be told that these, the models have it all figured out. Secular astronomers are confident that this whole gas cloud model works, when actually it doesn't. Next slide, please. Out beyond Neptune, there's a little world called Pluto. And secular modelers were shocked at what we found here in 2015. Next slide. Among other things, Pluto has a lot of smooth craterless terrain. Craterless means there hasn't been enough time for craters to form on it, so it must be very young. In fact, there were comments that said, this looks so young and fresh, this could have formed last week for all we can tell. It looks that young. So Pluto's surface, next slide, is being reworked apparently, but how? Next slide, please. There's no apparent source of heat for all this geological activity going on in Pluto. You can have radioactive decay inside of a world that will heat, uh, that will produce heat. Pluto doesn't have that, though, because its density is too low. Nor does it have tidal heating, that squeezing and flexing that has been, has been invoked for other objects that we've discussed. The only possible source for Pluto's heat to power this geological activity is primordial heat, left over from its formation. But Pluto's a tiny little world. I mean, if you look at it uh, compared to the continental United States, it's quite a bit smaller. It should have cooled off billions of years ago. So it can't have primordial heat anymore if it were billions of years old. Yet it apparently does. So if Pluto were created just a few, a few thousand years ago, as the Bible says, that's perfectly consistent with what we see. This isn't a problem at all. If it were formed billions of years ago, though, this is a serious problem. I'm going to have to skip forward a bit for the sake of time. Can you skip through the section that talks about comets? and go to the summary where it says, our solar system, where did it come from? Six slides or so? Yeah, thank you. So what have we talked about this morning? We went planet by planet through the solar system and touched on each world that we see briefly and some of the moons as well. Next slide. We talked briefly about the solar nebula model, the idea that this giant cloud of gas collapsed on its own under gravity and formed all these objects. Uh, two more slides. We asked, how could we tell if this model were accurate? And then three more slides, all the bullets. We asked, is each of these objects consistent with the model or inconsistent? We saw there are a lot of inconsistencies. And there's a lot more, by the way, that we didn't have time to discuss this morning. Does it look like the product of random processes, or does it look designed? That'll be the primary topic of my uh, next session. And do, they, do these objects look billions of years old? We saw a lot of evidence against that for many of these. And again, there's a lot more evidence besides this that we could talk about. Next slide, please. This also offers us a perspective on scientific truth. Over and over with these discoveries, you'll see quotes where people say, we need to go rewrite the textbooks. Well, that meant the textbooks were wrong, right? But up until that point, we're told, no, this, this is settled science. We know billions of years, natural processes, all the rest of it, you people who believe biblical creation, are just totally out to lunch. Well, it turns out the textbooks weren't right after all. Indeed, as one of my textbooks actually admits, next slide, please, thus far we have seen we know very little about the development of the solar system. At least this author was honest. Because the heavens don't declare that these objects formed by natural processes over billions of years. Instead, next slide, please, the heavens declared the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So this is the end of my presentation here. You might have noticed this is a rather unusual perspective on astronomy than what you would get elsewhere. <laughs> Next slide, please. I have a site called creationastronomy.com. One more slide. And I have a free email newsletter that talks about discoveries as they are made. If this type of thing interests you, then that's available to you. It's free. You won't be spammed um, to death. It only comes out a few times a year at this point. There's also, one more slide, uh, some DVDs I have available in back that Pastor Scudder mentioned. Uh, the material you saw here this morning is all excerpted from the first DVD in that series. Next slide, please. Which goes in-depth, planet by planet, through the solar system, talking about each planet and many other moons and a bunch of other objects as well. Next slide. Uh, it's a very visual presentation. I love looking at these objects, so that's what the video focuses on. Next slide. And to my mind, these are some of the most beautiful things God made. Next slide. So there's over 500 images in this full presentation discussing this. And if you can go back to the website with the galaxy, that would be good. So I've reached the end of my time. Thank you for your attention. And let's close in prayer if we could.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty and the majesty that you've created around us. We thank you, Lord, that you do declare your glory through that which you've created. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us the ability to perceive these things, and to glorify and honor you through them. Help us, Lord, to love you more through this and through all the other wonders that you present us with. Just help us, Father, to love you and serve you in all we do. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather and worship you together. We just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your attention.